his portraits among the most iconic in the world. His nudes, a masterclass in fine art photography. All captured in a stunning 50-year retrospective of his life's work in pictures titled, It's Not About Me. But make no mistake, it is in fact all about the lens, loves, and extraordinary life of photographer Greg Gorman, who seared the titans of our time into the zeitgeist with his defining eye and signature style. It's not what you say in the highlights, but what you don't say in the shadows. If you leave someone looking at a picture wanting to know more, then I feel that's a successful photograph. In the exotic, art-filled West Hollywood home he's lived in for almost 40 years, the passionate life behind the lens of photographer Greg Gorman is on full display. where he not only displays a lifetime collection of art, but creates his own as well. Come up a little bit more for the light. In his home studio, the master of light and shadows, forever captivated by beauty, shapes, and forms, shows his trademark gift of connection with those he shoots. Yeah, that's gorgeous, wow. For me, it's the challenge of getting inside their head. The excitement is breaking through those barriers and really connecting with a person. And connect he does, as seen in his countless books over the years. But it's by far his stunning 50-year retrospective, where portrait after portrait captures the soul and essence of the Hollywood greats. Working with light and shadow and probably what I'm best known for. The irony is there are no mid-tones. There are no three-quarter tones. It's an abrupt break between light and shadow. It's been quite the life behind the lens for a kid from Kansas. His first big break, a call to shoot David Bowie. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Then came Streisand. She was awesome. Went on to shoot album covers and do a million different things. Then the studios clamored for Gorman to shoot their blockbuster campaigns. But it was Andy Warhol's famed interview magazine that showcased Gorman's iconic portraits that literally seared his images into the zeitgeist and catapulted him to rarefied heights. Working with Interview Magazine was a big part of my success. There's no question about it. That and his game-changing LA iWorks campaign, where his most celebrated prints would revolutionize the power of celebrity portraits and their imprint on pop culture. LA iWorks, who knew at the time, would become a big part of my repertoire and what I became known for. But he's known for so much more. His VIP dinner parties legendary. His passion for wine and sharing with friends iconic. But breaking away from the glitz of Hollywood, he says, is also a must. Fishing a great escape. As is traveling the world, teaching photography to a whole new generation. Being able to give something back to people, to see if you can turn the lights on in somebody that has a drive and a passion for photography, and it's pretty awesome. But somehow, his studio always manages to reel him back home to shoot A-listers and friends. And of course, the latest album cover, Elton would have no one else, as Gorman is known for unmasking greatness, even when masked. This is Elton. He's just such a genius. Many would say it takes one to know one. Hollywood's most celebrated celebrity photographer, Greg Gorman. He is today's LA Story. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of LA Stories. I'm Giselle Fernandez and we are coming to you from West Hollywood, from the exotic, eclectic and sexy home of the man they call the master of light and they also call him the greatest celebrity photographer and fine arts photographer in the world, Mr. Greg Corman. What an honor. Nice to see you, Greg. Well, for me too. I'm so happy to do this with you. I'm thrilled to be able to come to you because congratulations are in order. You have just put together this incredible retrospective over 50 years of these titan portraits of people who have like seared into the zeitgeist and you captured their soul. 
How did it feel to look back, first of all, and see the expanse and, yes, the genius of your work? Well, it's funny, it happened so fast, and I was just so fortunate to get a good start in the business. And, you know, it's all by being in the right place at the right time, and then uh, everything else kind of falls into place. So how did you go through 160 boxes of negatives and transparencies and say, all right, I'll pare it down to this? Was it hard? It was very hard to go through everything. Um, it took over a year. I edited the pictures down to about 10,000. When I go back now and I go, damn, that's a good picture. I wish I'd have used that picture. You put Grace Jones, of everyone you've ever shot, you put that striking, elegant, fierce face on the cover of your retrospective, your latest book, of many books. Why? Because, quite honestly, I thought it was one of the more fine art images for the book. You know, it had kind of a graphic. It almost was like a Magritte with a hat is like floating a little bit. It was Grace, and she's one of my dearest friends, and I adore her. You know, Elton John, in your book, he writes the foreword, and it's so beautiful. He doesn't like to get his portrait taken by anybody. But he says, only Greg Gorman. So many have said the same, that you somehow unmask them. You make them relax and feel so comfortable. How do you do it? It's basically a question of winning their trust and confidence. Once you've got that in the palm of your hand, the rest falls into line. They say your secret sauce is that you are able to capture the authenticity, that raw spontaneity of the soul, which is very hard, especially in today's market where everything's so posed. How do you get beyond the pose? Uh, you look for those moments in between. The it's spontaneity. The spontaneity. And the funny thing is, when I finished this last book, I found those moments in between that were honestly much more honest than uh, some of the more staid portraits. You are renowned for your use of light and shadows. How would you describe that interplay? I tend to light with a uh, single point light source and then additive and subtractive fill. Adding light in or taking light away, I think people over light. And I think you can get the essence of a person best by channeling a single light on the best angle, the most advantageous part of who that person is and to capture that on film is a better way than putting lights coming in from 20 different angles. And do you know in the instant that you have it? Usually. Do you? Yeah, usually I know. And it's by not giving too much direction, but getting the body language. Body language obviously is incredibly important in a portrait in terms of if I lean into you like this, I have strength. Look what happens when my head comes this way. I've lost everything. So it's putting all those elements together to create a portrait. It's not just shadow and light, it's their tone. It's all about shape and form and balance to get that moment. You have said this was all kind of self-taught, yet you did go to USC, a master's in fine arts. So you had some training, but the self-taught part means what? That there's instinct there that can't be taught? Let me tell you, you didn't learn to do what you do by studying it in school or reading a book. I didn't learn how to take a picture by sitting in a classroom. You learn everything by doing it. That's the way I learned about wine. I mean, everything that we've developed in our lives, I think, comes from practical experience. It doesn't come anywhere else. It comes from the school of hard knocks because it's never what you're told. It's never what you expect. It's those unexpected moments that make you a better person and a better artist. So then what fuels your instinct and your passion? to shoot people and transcend the celebrity and get into the heart of the matter, as you call it. Yeah. it. For me, it's the challenge of getting inside their heads, breaking through those barriers and really connecting with a person. It's almost like disrobing. I recognize that it's not always a comfortable situation for most people. There's very few major talents that I've had in the studio that really enjoy being in front of a still camera. There's a handful. Leonardo DiCaprio was always brilliant in front of a still camera. I got them very pure and much more innocent. and you have something that you can play with and let them enjoy themselves and let them expose themselves in a way, a very natural way. You're a kid from Kansas, the Midwest, as far away from the, you know, hoopla of Hollywood you can imagine. And when you have these huge A-list stars come into your studio and there's big egos there, but you've always felt you're equal with them. Is that part of the secret of getting them to like really kind of hand themselves over to you? 100%. When I was hired to do Scarface, I had Al sitting behind the desk with all the coke piled up on the desk. <laughs> uh, and the AD came in and says, we're waiting for you. We're ready for you on the set, Mr. Pacino. And he said, well, Greg has been waiting all morning to do pictures. I'll let you know when we're done. Wow. So it's about mutual respect and understanding. You know, it's interesting because we're in this kind of agency handler, uh, you know, managers who come and say, this is what I'm looking for. But you have said that you've always focused on the desires, comfortability um, of the person you're shooting 
and you may have lost work over it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've never relied on a person in a cheap suit to tell me how to take a picture. <laughs> mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's the talent that are going to employ you. It's dealing with trust and confidence and not uh, betraying them. I mean, that's the most important thing. Let's take our viewers back to this kid in the Midwest. Right. You were going to go uh, to a Jimi Hendrix concert, 68, and you went to a friend and you borrowed their but Pentax yeah, buddy camera. Yeah, buddy I borrowed his camera. And the following morning, I went over to his home and we processed the film in his dark room in the basement. When I saw this image come up on this white piece of paper, I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. <laughs> you liked it, you yeah. were hooked right then. And it was pretty out of focus. And I don't know if it was because I shot it at a 60th of a second or I'd smoked too much pot. It was in the <laughs> hippie days I, when I actually had little hair on the top of this head. I did this for your light so you'd have to stare at this bald head. And uh, I was just completely hooked and it just blew me away. Yeah. And I knew right then that's what I wanted. And I've been so lucky that I, that's what I've been able to follow that all my life. So you're in California, you're in Los Angeles, and you're doing headshots for mid-level, you know, TV actors, etc. And then you had your first big break, a call from David Bowie. What did that mean to you when you got that call? I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, you know, I was very lucky that early on, and actually became pretty good friends and uh, shot for, you know, 10, 12 years, more than a half a dozen album covers and a gazillion single sleeves and stuff. And he was great, you know, he was awesome to work with. And then another big break. You got a call from Barbara Streisand. Exactly. She said, Greg, it's Barbara Streisand. I said, Hi. And she says, uh, I understand you're going to be the photographer on my movie. And I said, yes. And she says, how do you see shooting me? And I said to Barbara, I said, well, what colors do you like for background? She said, well, I like popsicle colors, <laughs> pinks and lavenders. We got along great. She was awesome. She was a perfectionist. She knew what worked and what didn't work. And we had a phenomenal relationship. Talk to me about Dustin Hoffman and Tootsie. Well, I worked on Tootsie and Dustin and I got along really well. And he said, well, I want to do a day with Greg in the movie where I shoot magazine covers and spreads. And so Dustin said, who do you know that we could bring in to shoot purported magazine covers? So I called Andy because knowing Andy was a celebrity monger. And <laughs> I asked Andy if he wanted to come over on the set and be in the picture with me. And he said, yeah, and was in the movie. I mean, he's in the movie because of me, which is kind of wild. Andy Warhol, he played such an integral part, not just in the movie Tootsie, obviously, with his interview magazine, which became this incredible platform for all of your iconic imagery, right? Yeah, actually, I was working on a little picture called Grease 2. <laughs> yeah, a little and picture. Maxwell Caulfield was the star with Michelle Pfeiffer. And Interview Magazine wanted him for a cover. And I had access to him, and that started my uh, career with Interview. And Interview really is responsible for a lot of photographers' careers, particularly the big LA photographers today. Because why? The reason is that we were given total creative freedom. Nobody came to tell us what to shoot, how to shoot it, what to do. I did more than a dozen covers for them over the years. Over the past five decades, you've done almost everyone of note. But even the Betty Davises, you know, the Brandos, um, what were they like? Well, they were amazing. I mean, with Betty Davis, I said, this is one time when I was nervous, Giselle, and I said, uh, I would like to meet her before the shit. I had no <laughs> idea what the hell to expect. So then they called me back, Miss Davis will receive you from 4 to 4.10 on Thursday. You got 10 minutes? <laughs> she was, you know, one of the greats, Giselle. And I remember there was a shoot I did for Life magazine, and we did the photographs at the St. James Club in L.A., which is now mm. the Tower Bar and Grill. We did these pictures on this staircase going up, and of course the hotel said, we would love a big blow up of Miss Davis to put on the wall. So then cut to maybe six weeks later, I pick up the phone and in her inimitable way, Greg, Betty Davis, I had dinner last night at the St. James Club and they moved the blah, blah, blah picture. Tell them if they don't put it back, they can't effing have it, click. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just unbelievable. Just so crazy. Just an amazing person, you know. I loved her. Talk to me about shooting Michael Jackson. Um, those images with the lace over his face. He had the idea of the lace from the Gloria Swanson picture. And the spider picture came about. He says, you know, Greg, I have these tarantulas and they've just shed their skin. I think they'd make a great picture. So he brought them because they look exactly like the tarantula. He lived in a children's world. He never really grew up. 
and you know, I don't want to comment on everything that happened, but I will tell you that um, I had a lot of respect for him, and I loved working with him. Mm, yeah. And then the LA Iwerks campaign came, and that was also a game changer for you, right? I would say the two biggest influences on my career were my work with Interview Magazine and my campaign for LA Iwerks. It was an interesting campaign. Uh, Faces like a work of art, it deserves a great frame. You know, it's this little eyeglass company, and it put them on the map, really. Didn't Andy Warhol ask you to be yes, in it? Yes, actually, Andy called me one day and said, uh, "Hi, Greg. It's Andy. Uh, do you think uh, uh, that uh, uh, that it would be uh, uh, I would be good for a LA Iwerks ad?" And I said, "I think so." Well, unbeknownst to me at the time, it became my most celebrated image. It's my most famous picture that I ever took. And do you love it? I do love it. You know, it's a, it's a it's a it's like a it's a footprint, a stamp. I feel lucky to have been able to take that picture and shoot it. At the time, didn't really think about it. He wrote about it later in his diaries and said that my makeup artist was the only person that ever screwed his wig on straight, <laughs> which I thought was a classic line. If you had to choose your top five favorites, what would you say? Well, I would say Andy. I would say Grace. Nudes, I would have to put Tony Bent over the nude I did of Iman, of, of David's wife. And I would say the close-up of Leo would have to favor pretty well in there. Let's talk about your nudes. Um, they are among my favorite of your work. Well, it's interesting how it uh, kind of all came about. My late friend Antonio Lopez, I went to see him one day. I was probably in my early 30s. So what have you been doing, Greg? <laughs> and I said, well, I just shot the posters for Tootsie, Big Chill, Scarface. And I thought, this is, he's going to be impressed. And he looked me coldly in the eyes and he said, well, that's great, but what are you doing for yourself? And that's when I decided to give a self-imposed assignment to kind of pull the camera back, shed the people of their clothes, but still maintain the dynamic range between my highlights and shadows so that it's still linked into my work. And then I started doing my forms in reference to, you know, Greek and Roman sculpture, so to speak. Do you feel like you push the envelope when you shoot, like trying to kind of transcend what's expected? <laughs> I knew you'd get me on a few questions. Um, I don't want to say that I'm a safe photographer. I'm protective of the talent. Let's put it that way. I never try to go over the top, but I don't, I don't mind a little, as John Waters would say, shock value. But you're very, um, you're very centered on authenticity. In fact, when you review your work, I've read that you go, oh, I wasn't being true to myself there. I'm careful in that respect, and, and, and that's being protective. To me also, is this an image that I would want to have out there that projects what I'm trying to say? That's critical. Is an artist ever truly satisfied with his work? If they are, they lose their, uh, their real credibility, I think. I always say when I think I've taken the perfect picture, it's time to hang up the camera. I think this is a really good place to take a break, but when we come right back, Greg Gorman's life and lens goes where he never thought before. His latest passion, when LA Stories comes right back. You can hear more of this conversation on my podcast, LA Stories Unfiltered. Listen now on the Spectrum News app or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to LA Stories, everyone. I'm Giselle Fernandez in conversation with photographer extraordinaire, certainly one of the, the greats of our time and celebrated as such, Greg Gorman. Welcome back. Thanks for inviting us into your incredible home, Greg. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm happy to have you here again. So during COVID, you said that you had no subjects and everything was kind of clamped down. And you did something that you thought you'd never do. You took still art. Talk to me about your African voodoo dolls. What about them draws you to them? If you take a look at them carefully and you look at a lot of our great artists, they were such a tremendous influence on Picasso. All of the great American and European artists drew influences from African art. And these are unacknowledged geniuses of art from these tribes that people would ever, never even realize. And it's just been such a great project to shoot something. I don't have to feed them. They don't have to use the bathroom. <laughs> they don't talk back to me. If I don't like the picture, I can reshoot them without having to have a reason why. It's awesome. <laughs> I should have been a still life photographer. <laughs> you have many passions. Wine is another one. And I thank you for opening it for this interview. Just for our viewers' sake, because you describe it so poetically, tell me all the flavors and notes and tones I'm tasting. This is a wine from a dear friend of mine, Stefano Inama, and I just think it's exquisite. On the Italian side, because the grape is Carmenere, so you're getting very unctuous, beautiful fruit from the Carmenere, beautiful black fruit. But on the terroir side, you're getting kind of that sweaty saddle, tobacco, 
leather, matchsticks. I mean, it's a stunning wine. It's it just gorgeous, gorgeously encapsulated in that glass. It was a 2012. <laughs> it's really a brilliant wine, yeah. Why did you sell your vineyard? It was time to move on. It's also time at 72 to simplify my life. I think it's one of the biggest parts about COVID for so many people is a, a day of reckoning in a very personal and, and, and uh, simplification. intimate way. Simplification. Mm -hmm. You had prostate cancer that spread to your lungs. You still stayed very hopeful and optimistic. Talk to me about how that diagnosis changed your lens on life and how you muscled through it. It's a weird story because I'd had I never was sick a day in my life. I've been a gay man all my life. I never got HIV. And, and I mean, I feel very blessed for so many things. You know, it's just surreal. I mean, it's surreal. You just don't think about this. I never saw it happening. I never had an issue. They did some radiation. It's something, obviously, when cancer metastasizes that you've got to watch it. But you know what? I'm living day to day. I'm healthy. My numbers are good. And it's on the back burner. I'm, it's, I'm not going to dwell on this stuff. I've never regretted anything. I've lived life to the fullest. I'm not going to let anything slip by. And if I die tomorrow, I have no regrets. You are renowned for your dinner parties. Such an assemblage of iconic personalities. And they continue on to this day, don't they? Still do them. I just started back up again. You know, we had Leonardo DiCaprio, Mark Wahlberg, all of them here, Bette Midler, David Bowie. Elton all, John. Elton John, many times. Elton comes every year. You just happened to shoot Elton John's new cover for his album, this beautiful masked portrait with him in the sunglasses. Talk to me about Elton John. I think one of the most beautiful things about growing old, which always surprises other people that are much younger and they don't understand what age has to do with relationships with people, because it's a beautiful thing and it's a huge, big deal. When they came in town a few weeks ago, they were here, I saw them like every day. You know, we shot and then I shot David and then I shot the kids. The oldest boy uh, loves fishing. I'm so jealous. You're a big fisherman from your youth. Yeah, yeah. I love to fish. And that's really my passion now. I love being in the outdoors and I love fishing. Yeah, so much so. Passion. It makes, it's, that's the difference, isn't it? It's totally the difference. And I think that's really why I got into education. And I basically spend most of my life now teaching and doing my personal art more than the commercial part. That's a big part of my life now. And I teach all over the world. And I always tell people to step outside their comfort zone. I'm never interested in seeing what they know. I want to see what they don't know to try to push them to that next level. Your legacy, what do you want your legacy to be? You know, I'm hoping people will remember me for my work and, you know, and I work, you know, with the Elton John AIDS Foundation. I just hope people will just, you know, hopefully respect what I've been so fortunate to have had a very warm and successful career. I feel very lucky to have been able to do what I did all these years. It's kind of great. Anyone who has had the privilege and honor of being photographed by you will remember you just like that. And we thank you so much for your magic and uh, is sharing that with everyone you shoot, and that's what opens us up to you. So, Greg Gorman, what a privilege and an honor. Well, thank you so much. I'm such a fan of the show. It's so beautifully produced, and the content is crazy. You've done such a great job. Well, thank you. You are the epitome of the L.A. story, and I just feel so honored. I mean, I had my photograph taken by you back in the day when I had no wrinkles, and it was the best picture that anyone has ever taken of me, a portrait. And we get to share your gorgeous and iconic work with all of Los Angeles, the Southland, and the world. So thank you. And thank you for watching another edition of LA Stories. I'm Giselle Fernandez. We will see you next time. You can hear more of this conversation on my podcast, LA Stories Unfiltered. Listen now on the Spectrum News app or wherever you get your podcasts.